Dear Bible's family, may peace be with you. Want to share an update on our recent situation. Our recording studio in our workplace had been broken into by thieves twice. They stole many important pieces of our filming and recording equipment. So our cameras, our lenses, and some of our lights in our tripods were stolen by the thieves. We sincerely ask you to pray for God's continued grace, so that we can produce Bible Race videos daily with no interruption, and continue to provide spiritual food for God's people. We'll be moving to a new studio location. Please pray that our recording work will not be affected during the move. Please pray for wisdom, so that we know what equipment we need to purchase and to invest in. During the process of resetting the recording studio, we only hope to spend money. On things that are necessary, we are implementing security measures. Please pray for God's grace. We also welcome your donation to support us through this reconstruction process. May God bless you abundantly, and let's read the Bible every day so that you'll be full of faith. The Book of First King, Chapter Three: Solomon's Prayer for Wisdom. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at high places. However, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statues of David his father. Only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings at the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said. Ask what I shall give you, and Solomon said, "You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness, and heart toward you, and you have kept from him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day, and now." O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen a great people, too many to be numbered and or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. Or who is able to govern this? Your great people. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God said to him, "Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like." You has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes, my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. Solomon's wisdom. Then two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, "Oh, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth, and we were alone. There was no one else with us in the house. Only we two were in the house, and this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him." 
And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me, while your servant slept, and lay him at her breast, and lay her dead son at my breast. When I arose in the morning to nurse my child, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, behold, he was not the child that I had born, but the other woman said, No, the living child is mine, and the dead child is yours. The first said, No, the dead child is yours, and the living child is mine. Thus they spoke before the king. Then the king said, The one says, This is my son that is alive, and your son is dead. The and the other says, No, but your son is dead, and my son is the living one. And the king said, Bring me a sword. So a sword was brought before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to one and half to the other. Then the woman whose son was alive said to the king, Because her heart yarned for her son, Oh, my lord, give her the living child, and by no means put him to death. But the other said, he shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. Then the king answered and said, Give the living child to the first woman, and by no means put him to death. She is his mother. And all Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king, because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to do justice. Chapter 4 Solomon's Officials King Solomon was king over all Israel, and these were his high officials. Azariah, the son of Sadak, was the priest. Liharev and Ahijah, the sons of Shasha, were secretaries. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilat, was recorder. Nanaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was in command of the army. Sadak and Abiatar were priests. Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers. Zabad, the son of Nathan, was priest and king's friend. Ahishar was in charge of the palace. And Adoniram, the son of Abda, was in charge of forced labor. Solomon had twelve officers over all Israel who provided food for the king and his household. Each man had to make provision for one month in the year. These were their names. Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim, ben the care in Makaz, Baabim, Beth Shemesh, and Elon Beth Hanan, ben Hesed in Arabah, Elon Soko, and all the land of Hepher, ben Abinadab, and all Nephath Dor. He had Tapath, the daughter of Solomon, as his wife, Benah, the son of Ahilat, in Tana, Megiddo, and all Beth Shion, that is beside Shadan, below Jazari, and from Beth Shion to Abel Mahala, as far as the other side of Jomiam ben Gaber in Ramaf Gilead. He had the villages of Jair, the son of Manasseh, which are in Gilead, and he had the region of Arga, which is in Bashan, sixty great cities with walls and bronze bars. Ahinadab, the son of Idol in Mahananim, Maas, in Naphtali, he had taken Basemath, the daughter of Solomon, as his wife. Bana, the son of Hushai in Asher, and Beloth, Hazafak, the son of Parira in Issachar. Jimei, the son of Ella in Benjamin. Geber, the son of Urai in the land of Gilead, the country of Ion king of the Amorites, and of Ah, uh, king of Bashan, and there was one governor who was over the land, Solomon's wealth and wisdom. Judah and Israel were as many as the sand by the sea. They ate and drank and were happy. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all days of his life. Solomon's provision for one day was 30 quarts of fine flour and 60 quarts of meal, 10 fat oxen and 20 pasture-fed cattle, a 100 sheep besides their gazelles, roebucks, and fat and fall, for he had dominion over all the region west of the Euphrates from Ipsa to Gaza.
over all the kings west of the Euphrates, and he had peace on all sides around him. And Judah and Israel lived in safety, from Dan even to Bathsheba. Every man under his vine. And under his fig trees, all the days of Solomon. Solomon also had forty thousand stalls of horses for his chariots, and twelve thousand horsemen. And those officers supplied provisions for King Solomon, and for all who came to King Solomon's table, each one in his month. They let nothing be lacking. Barley also, and straw for horses, and swift steeds. They brought to the place where it was required, each according to his duty. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure, and breath of mind like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all other men, wiser than Ethan the Azurite, and Heman, Calco, and Darda the sons of Maho. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He also spoke three thousand prophets, and his songs were one thousand five. He spoke of trees, from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts, and of birds, and of reptiles, and of fish. And people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and from all the kings on of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. Amen. Dear Bible Raised family and friends, let's look at chapters three to four of First Kings today. Chapters three to eleven of First Kings talk about the glory of the kingdom of Solomon. Chapter three, verse one: Solomon's marriage alliance to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now we can see that after Solomon has established his throne, the first thing mentioned in the Book of Kings was his marriage to Pharaoh's daughter. The way the Bible recorded this account made it seem like, after all Solomon's work to establish his kingdom, the epiphany of it all was to bring in Pharaoh's daughter. I think God deliberately described it in this way here. So when you read it, it feels like Solomon did all of this was for Pharaoh's daughter. Through this, Holy Spirit is. Foreshadowing us that in the future, these foreign concubines and wives will entrap Solomon's heart, and the gods that they bring will ensnare Solomon's reign. Now, reading this passage, you're aware that Solomon's about to enter into the prime of his reign, but at the same time, there is a small seed of corruption, and decline is also plant planted. Uh, as I read this, I I became really weary in my heart because just when you think everything's fine, like Solomon had a life changing God encounter and he was given wisdom as well as commission to build the temple, everything was on the up and up. Now the marriage with the Egyptian pharaoh's daughter was also a successful political alliance, and since this was a political marriage, we would think that Solomon wouldn't be tempted by the idols. Um, as he was so firmly established in his loyalty to God. Again, this、uh, recorded right here. This is the best time in Solomon's life. Unknowingly, though, these little compromises, these little tolerances, was already beginning to erode into Solomon, Solomon's life, and in turn, Israel's foundation. Dear family, when you are doing well and feel like you're solid in your walk, that you will never think it possible to fall away,、uh, we really shouldn't think I will never be tempted. We must remember it is really by the grace of God that I am standing. Don't tolerate the oh, just a little temptation. I'll just give in a little bit, just a little bit, day in day out. Eventually. You will find that a completely different fruit, a completely different walk, will issue out of your life. So let's look at the second to fourth verse. These three verses will mention that Solomon sacrificed at the high places. It's another reason why God's people eventually will fall into sin. The second verse tells that the people were sacrificing at high places. However, Because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord, 
Now there were about twelve kings in the southern kingdom of Judah, seven or eight of whom did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But God said of them, Although you have done what is right in the eyes of the Lord, you have not teared down the high places. From that point onward, whether or not the high places were torn down became a standard of whether God's people were obedient and faithful to God. So what exactly is this high places? These are open air altars built on elevated places such as a high hill, since high places. Now it was originally a place where the Canaanites worshiped their own gods. After the Israelites entered into the land of Canaan, their lives were still centered around the tabernacle. Uh, but after each tribe dispersing to their inheritance throughout the region, Israelites began to worship God in places where they resided. At the time, they would use the Canaanites' high places to worship God. In Deuteronomy 12, verses 13 to 14, Moses actually said to the people, Take care that you do not offer your burnt offerings at any place that you see, but at the place that the Lord will choose in one of your tribes. There you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command. I am commanding you. But after 400 years, Israelites became less and less faithful to God's law, God's word. They began to imitate the Canaanites in offering sacrifices at high places, thinking, well, I already had a tabernacle, and uh, there are the high places. What I'm offering or worshiping was to God, Jehovah. As long as there are sacrifices and offering to Jehovah, well, I don't need to go to the place that's in it by God. I'm already worshiping right here at the sacred place. So as time goes by, everybody eventually moved away from being vigilant in observing God's laws. All things pertaining to God became kind of like a gray area to be discussed, open to interpretation. Dear family, high places in this passage represent a compromised faith. Even after Solomon built the temple for the Lord, there was still no absolute fidelity to the Lord. The high places were not abolished. This became a snare for future generations to fall back into the path of idolatry. A small compromise here and there, carelessness in obeying God's word, became catastrophic down the line. So dear family, I don't know if there are many similar situations in our church today. Um, to compromise a little here and there in order to practice understanding and acceptance. If someone you are discipling is living in a style of sin, um, if a couple is living together outside the covenant of marriage, do you dare to tell them the absolute truth from God's word? Now, the other one that I see is the overemphasis on the gospel of grace, which is very prevalent among churches right now. Because our economy is difficult and our work pressure is high, sometimes it's easy to encourage believers by emphasizing that, oh, as long as you're faithful uh, in attending church and consistent in giving and serving, God will bless you. God's going to make everything okay. But there's nothing mentioned about repentance or cutting off areas of our lives that are displeasing to God. Dear family, if we only emphasize one part of the truth at the expense of the whole, in this process, in order to be considerate or to be a good person, to be positive, encouraging, but in this process, if the truth of God is compromised, uh, my dear family, this is how um, apostasy happen in church. A small deviation here, a small deviation there. It is really important for us not to come to church and pick and choose what we want to engage in, what pleases us, what makes sense to us. We have to listen to God and what He wants us to hear. There's a big difference. Then we see that Solomon loved the Lord and obeyed the law of his father David. After he finished the worship and sacrifice at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to him at night in a dream. Gibeon is located in the territory of the tribe of Benjamin and uh, at the time was one of the Le Levitical cities. 
was about 40 kilometers away from the city of David. After the destruction of Shiloh, the tabernacle and the bronze altar that Moses had built in the desert was relocated to a high place at Gibeon. Now, after David brought the, bar, uh, the ark back to Jerusalem, the tabernacle and the bronze altars remained in Gibeon. The Gibeonites, the indigenous people of Canaan who lived there, also made a covenant with Israel had an earlier generation to become laborers who carried water and chop wood for the tabernacle of God. It was not until the Israelites returned from captivity and they rebuilt the temple, we also noticed that a Gibeonite's descendant was also mentioning that account. Um, from this, we know that the Gibeonites were actually very faithful in serving God and became a beautiful testimony of how Gentiles turn to God and remain faithful. From this verse, we can see that Solomon actually loved God very much at this time, and he obeyed God wholeheartedly. So God appeared to him and spoke to him, ask whatever you want me to give you, and then I will give it to you. <laughs> Do you envy that? Do you want to be like Solomon? In the New Testament era, as long as we ask for what is according to God's will, we will receive. Solomon was still a young man around 20 years old at the time, so he was actually very insecure, unsure, and fearful when he became king. You see, at this time, his older brother even wanted to usurp the throne. Um, uh, the rest of the uh, uh, officers and ministers were also the old administration who may not necessarily be fully supportive of him. So Solomon's standing was not very secure. He asked God for wisdom, and God answered him. Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life, or riches, or the life of your enemy, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has ever been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. So you see right here from this passage, Solomon's wisdom is the most excellent in his generation and thereafter also. But the most important part um, is recorded in the following verses. Now verse 13, I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare to you all your days. Uh, but continuing, God's promises in ver verse 14 has a condition attached to it. And if you walk in my ways, keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. We can learn from this account. First, Solomon did not ask for himself, and this touched God's heart and pleased him because he was following God's will. Remember that David once said that God made him king uh, because of the people of Israel. It's because God was looking for a shepherd to shepherd Israel. That's why God made David king. So Solomon right here is not for himself. He's not king for his own benefit. But in order to govern God's people well, he had to ask God for this. Now we need to pray according to God's will and touch God's heart. You know, our God is a generous God. He said that I will give you even the things you didn't ask for. I was really touched when I read this passage. Our God is really the best father. He is generous in giving all good things to his children without holding back. He also knows what kind of things to withhold from us because having it will cause us to stumble and be tempted and fall away from God. Do you believe that God always gives you what is the best? Also, we have to read the Bible to know how to follow God's will. If we ask according to His will, we will be able to touch His heart and we will receive everything we ask for. The second thing we learned here is that God answered um, to Solomon's uh, God answered Solomon's prayer for wisdom 
and that given him wisdom that is unprecedented and unparalleled. With that wisdom, Solomon wrote the wisdom literature of Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, etc. These words examine issues of life with deep insights. In chapter 8, verse 1, does not wisdom call? And this is from uh, Proverbs. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? Oh, but the most important thing is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom your days will be many, and your years will be added to your life. Also Proverbs 3, 7. Solomon uh, recorded right here. He said, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So when you see that uh, Solomon has so much wisdom and understanding, recording all of that, but as we uh, read the rest of his life, he still couldn't do it. At the end of his life, he still strayed from God. Now, you know that in the New Testament era, Holy Spirit is indwelling within us. As long as we abide in Him and He abiding us, we will walk in wisdom and live a life that pleases God, faithful till the end. So uh, let's look at the letter of James. There's a promise that if anyone lacks wisdom, we should ask God for it. James also explained that the wisdom is from above. Wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. It's very interesting what he said here. It doesn't matter how high your IQ is, how good your EQ can be, or how insightful that you can be into people's minds. What he's talking about right here, James, is all about our character. Now, do you have an upright character? Are you peaceful? Are you gentle and meek? Are you full of mercy and purity? Because my dear family, this is the wisdom from God. Jesus is wisdom. So if you get true wisdom that comes from above, it must be without prejudice and hypocrisy. It must be full of mercy, purity, and good fruits. Why? Because God is not just wisdom. He's also compassionate. He's also loving. He's also pure. He's also good. And he's also righteous. So when you have the wisdom of God, these attributes are also included because Jesus is our wisdom. When you have Jesus, we actually have everything. So dear family, the wisdom of this world is really completely different from the wisdom of God. Let's look at chapter 4, verses uh, 1 to 6. Now, in this uh, section, it records Solomon's administrative reforms. Um, in his wisdom, he did not dismantle many of the uh, establishments that his father David has set up. And this is really important as the successor. Solomon, in his wisdom, kept many loyal officials from David's court, as well as uh, their descendants. We see that in David's list of cabinet members, generals were mentioned first. Whereas in Solomon's cabinet, the list started with priests. We also want to know that David's position for guards, the personal bodyguards, were eliminated by the time of Solomon's administration because there was no such need during this time of peace. However, two positions uh, that were added or emphasized in Solomon's administration were um, were the 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 office in charge of the palace and of also the office in charge of forced labor. From this record, we can uh, stipulate that the royal family has expanded for Solomon and necessitated an officer to be in charge of the ongoings of the palace affairs and also uh, forced label, people's burdens also getting heavier and heavier because another officer was needed to oversee forced labors. Uh, now, the position of being charge of the palace affairs was quite important, even surpassing that of the general secretary. 
The uh, one other position, the Office of the Forced Laborers, was created after Absalom's rebellion, and Solomon retained David's original officers to oversee this position of the labored forces. Uh, from verses 1 to 6, we also see that Solomon's cabinet members were deliberately listed as 12 names to correspond to the 12 tribes uh, in the whole land of Israel. In verses 7 to 19, Solomon appointed 12 officials in the whole land so that they can provide food for the king and the royal family. Each official rotated one month per year to provide food for the king and his officials. This is administrative organization of Solomon's. We also know that the territory of the entire country and with the ongoing constructions of the infrastructure, the palaces, the country is just expanding. Um, even the royal family is also expanding, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but I want to highlight that at this time, Solomon loved God deeply, and he was walking humbly, leaning upon the Lord, because he knew he needed wisdom from the Lord to be king. Dear family, I don't know whether you have experienced this kind of dependence on the Lord in uh, the arena of your family, your ministry, your work, your relationships. Have you ever just called out to the Lord, Lord, what you have entrusted to me is so big beyond what can I, what I can do. This is the time for us to run and turn to the Lord and ask Him for wisdom. God will never put us in a position but not give us the wisdom that we need in this position. All we need to do is to ask Him and to rely on Him with all of our hearts. This is the invitation, family. Amen. Dear Bible Race viewers and families in Christ, thank you for watching our videos. We hope our sharing can enrich your life. If you find the content helpful, we hope you will support our ministry so we may continue to produce high-quality videos to serve the kingdom of God and hope to bless more people's lives. You can donate in the following ways. Online giving by PayPal. If you are residing in Taiwan, you may also donate by bank transfer. Thanks again for your viewing and support. Every contribution is our greatest encouragement. We sincerely appreciate your support. May God bless you abundantly. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Dear families, we hope that you enjoy the Bible race as much as we do. If you are willing to volunteer to translate the original Chinese teaching into English or assist with video editing, please email service at 360sunrise.com. Thank you.